I'm Lynn Wheeler, the board chair, and the reason um, I'm up here instead of Jason is sadly uh, Jason and his wife Rachel, are, they're dealing with some health issues, so I know you'll keep them in your prayers. Is Pastor Matt here? Pastor Matt? All right, well, then I will say that we always have greetings from Pastor Matt, the man who can do anything. Now he's back in the AV booth, and he is a fabulous, fabulous community guy, and we're just so fortunate to be here and to work with him. And Matt, thank you for all that you and the church does for the community. We really appreciate it. Um, on your table, you will find a brochure for the Tawny Town Agriculture Exhibit. Does everybody see that copy on there? There's a copy on everyone's table. This opened on Sunday. It's on Main Street in Tawny Town. I don't see, is Nancy here? Anyway, Nancy um, Eiler did, has done a fabulous job uh, putting this exhibit together. She combed and called in farm equipment and farm photos and wonderful, wonderful things from all over the community. Doris, I know you've been uh, helping her out too. And uh, thank you, it's a fabulous exhibit. It really is. So one thing they're doing that's really cool is they have a scavenger hunt. And uh, they have like 20 things you have to find in the exhibit. So be sure to go up there and check it out. The hours, it's open until November 19th. The hours are on this brochure. But it is really, really very well done. And, and the, you know, the scavenger hunt is great fun. And uh, I admire the folks up there for the tremendous work they did to put together very, very interesting exhibits. So I hope you'll get a chance to get up to Tawny Town uh, between now and November. Uh, a couple of things coming up uh, in May. We have Steve Allgaier. You know Steve, he's a fabulous tree uh, guru in Carroll County and he's gonna be talking to us about historic trees in our county. Um, in June, we have uh, a gentleman who's in the Revolutionary War group, he's going to talk. And in July, we have Marty and, and uh, Ken Hankins talking about their incredible work that they have done uh, to provide uh, Shiloh pottery and all that is engaging in the community there. So uh, there are just some of the things coming up. Also, we're in the midst of uh, formulating our strategic plan. So if you can join us on May 3rd from 4 to 6, we'll be convening in Cockies to get your feedback on uh, the plan. So please look at your calendars and see if you can join us. I believe that's a Wednesday, or it might be Thursday, I don't know, but it's May 3rd. So please uh, try to join us to give us your input on the plan. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Jack McBride White. Now I first met Jack many years ago when he wrote the fantastic book, In Carrie's Footsteps, uh, the Long Walk of Warren Dorsey. Did you all have, how many of you have read that book? Good, then he know, you know that he has a big fan club here. And of course, Jack and Warren came around the community and uh, did talks and interviews and it was totally delightful. And I'm glad that that was uh, the first Carroll County One book when uh, Jack published it. Uh, also, Jack is the author of The Keeper of the Ferris Wheel, which won the grand prize in the Writer's Digest National Publishing Award and was picked up by Penguin, which of course now is Penguin Random House. Um, and he has uh, continued to do his great research in the Sykesville area. He has a new book out, which he has over at the table, if you'd like to get an autographed copy. That is called Sykesville Stories, and this is the first edition, first volume, right, Jack? Um, so more to come on Sykesville Stories. And I know, like Frank Badovic, if Jack is, is telling the story, 
is bound to be very entertaining. Today, he's going to focus on a uh, special story having to do with two uh, German gentlemen who ended up uh, in Sykesville, right? Three. So uh, I'll let him uh, give you the detail on that. Jack, thank you for all you've done to promote and tell us about the stories of Carroll County. Um, you have also been uh, uh, at the Gateway Museum. You've done a lot of work to keep history alive for us, and we're very, very grateful to have you here today. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> One thing the pastor can't do is let me click through the slides. <laughs> so I'm going to be calling on him to do it because there's a lot of cool slides. Um, I'm going to be mainly talking about three doctors who came from Europe to flee the Nazis and ended up in Sykesville. When I wrote in Carrie's Footprints, When I wrote in Carrie's Footprints, <laughs> I found out that Carrie's family came here because their family was working at Springfield. Her husband got a job as a cook in Springfield. Springfield did not take care of white patients, but they employed white people. And most of his family worked there over the years, mostly as cooks. So that kind of got me introduced to Springfield. Then while I was working at the gatehouse, a guy showed up and told me his mom died at Springfield in 1950, and her name was Helen, and she died there. And while researching her, and through other means, I came to realize that all the doctors over there were German. In fact, I interviewed a guy named Guy Haney, who was a World War II vet, and he went to work at Springfield in 1946 in the men's ward, and he said, yeah, all the doctors there were German, and they had German accents. He didn't like them, except for one named Herman Solomon. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe they went out and recruited German psychiatrists and psychologists because maybe they were the best. Sigmund Freud was an Austrian Jew, but that wasn't the case. During World War II, all the people who worked there had to leave to go fight. There were vacancies. And all these Germans and Austrians were fleeing Hitler. So they came to Springfield and ended up at Sykesville. Um, wrote this book, Sykesville Stories. It's a collection of stories about Sykesville. But to me, the most interesting story, which I only did three pages on, is the one about these doctors. So today I want to talk about two of them briefly and then at more, in more length about one. His name's Kirk Glaser, and the reason I know a lot about him is because after he did Schindler's List, um, Steven Spielberg got really interested in this whole story, and he started something called the Showa Project, and they collected the personal recollections of all these survivors of the death camps and all. One of them, who I found on YouTube was named Kirk Glaser. He was interviewed over at Fairhaven in Sykesville for three and a half hours, and he tells his whole fascinating story. So mainly I'm gonna talk about him. All right, so just briefly about Springfield. I just put that one up there so that you can see the entryway, see how vast it was. That's the, the you're coming in there, you're in the women's wards which are now called Warfield and owned by the town of Sykesville. And Sykesville hasn't done much with them yet. Some of them have been renovated. But you can see it's a big, long road. This is in the 20s. You can see the vastness of it. The Hubner building was where people were processed in. And um, Helen Starlipper came in and lived there for a couple years. And in the Hubner building, they actually tried to cure people. Mostly, they were just taking care of people. They called it custodial care. When you went to custodial care, they weren't trying to cure you. There were thousands of people over there, and they were just taking care of them. After Helen was deemed unsavable or whatever, 
They moved her up to Clark Circle, which was built for epileptic patients. At one point, they had to separate the insane epileptics from the rest of the people, so they built these cottages. You can get the year of that because there's only two cottages, and eventually there were five in a circle, and they called it Clark Circle. This is just a view of the women's group, which I said is called Warfield and owned by Sykesville. You can see that it's somewhat collapsing. At least you can see that one building. You know, the buildings are old, 100 years old. This is the men's group. Martin Gross was one of these German doctors. His wife was also a German doctor, and they were, he was a big shot over there way back in the 40s. And uh, you can see that it's also, it's in worse shape than Warfield. It's owned by the state, isn't it, John? It's owned by the state, and they're not doing anything with it. It's fun to walk back there, but it's, it's falling apart. I just took that picture Sunday. So, this is the staff in 1950. Most of these people probably came from Europe. They're Jews. The little guy down on the end in the white coat, that's Dr. Sonnenfeld. He was, he was Helen's doctor. I read a lot of what he wrote about her. He was very, a very good writer, very articulate. Um, the guy in the middle was in charge. That's Robert Gardner. He was there for many years. Up in the far corner, of, up in this corner, this is uh, Ellis Margolin. He was the pathologist. He was also Jewish, but he's from Texas, not from Europe. Ilse Kahn's behind him. Right to his left, she's important. Her name is Irene Hitchman, and we'll be getting into her story. Ava Solomon is not up there. We'll be getting into her story. Her husband is up there. We'll just, we'll just go with that. Kirk Glaser's not up there. He came to Springfield later. So go to the next slide. So I, was, I, I interviewed this guy named um, Guy Haney in his house. He's 95. He just turned 95. He's the one who talk, told me about all the doctors he worked for. He worked in the men's room, how they were all Germans. And he told me that Dr. Herman Solomon was the one he liked the best. And he said, Dr. Solomon walked with a limp and had been tortured by the Nazis. And that's possibly where I went off on researching all this. But actually, Dr. Solomon wasn't tortured by the Nazis. I don't know why he limped. This is Dr. Solomon's wife, Ava. So Ava was born wealthy. She had servants. Um, she never had to work. When World War I started in 1914, her brother went to war, and she swore that she would not eat until he came back. When he returned in 1919, she weighed 74 pounds, and she was, I think, 18? You can see she was 18, she weighed 75 pounds. And it turns out that she had anorexia. She says she was mentally sick. She had a, an eating disorder. And they actually, many, many years later, they, they were fascinated by her because she's one of the first known anorexics. But anyway, they stayed in Germany too long. He was also wealthy. They, they considered themselves members of the German Jewish aristocracy. One day, the Gestapo came to her house, came to their house. The Gestapo guy was there to investigate their finances, and his goal was to find some sort of a financial impropriety which would give him an excuse to take them away and have them executed. Herman was like this saint. He didn't even think he should get paid for being a doctor. He knew nothing about money. When the Gestapo guy said to him, tell me about your mortgage, he whispered to Ava, what's a mortgage? And the Gestapo guy was so disarmed by that, he said, there's nothing here, and let them go. They let them go. Okay, so they had to bribe their way out of Germany. They, they, they were allowed to go, and she says they stayed too long. They had to give up everything they owned, Somehow they were able to get to New York City with basically nothing and start a whole new life. Let me see. 
So she never learned to cook. She didn't know how to take care of a house. She ended up peddling aprons on, on the streets of New York. And he was depressed. He didn't, want it. he didn't want this new life. He was happy where he was. He didn't know what to do with himself. He went to school to learn to be a sculptor. She started nursing. Then when we entered World War I, she started helping um, refugee doctors. Eventually, she heard about Springfield. And she convinced Herman that he had to go there because he could get a job there as a doctor. And that's how Ava and Herman eventually came to Sykesville. So you see, she said, we belong to Jewish aristocracy. It was unthinkable that we could be a persecuted minority. They, they thought they were well off. She didn't realize she was a Jew until someone told her. She grew up thinking that she was a German. Next one. Okay, so there's a lot more to Ava's story. She stayed in Sykesville. She became a big shot over at the hospital. She became a, in charge of, 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 of social work. You know, you know they, they, they had psychiatrists and psychologists, but another important aspect of it all was a social work, integrating the people in and out of the hospital, trying to get them into homes. And this was a social work function. And a woman named uh, Henrietta DeWitt was, created this program. And when she died young, Ava took over. They made her retire when she turned 70. She lived to 95 in Sykesville. And if you could just go back a couple to that picture of her. Yeah, this is a picture taken by the Baltimore Sun near the end of her life. And you know, she had seen all kinds of terrible stuff, but she still says she's an optimist. She still believes people can change. Okay, let's go up. Now, Irene Hitchman was also a big shot at Springfield. And she got there in 1940. She comes from Innsbruck in the Austrian Alps. Her father was the rabbi of Innsbruck. He died in 1933. At one point, Hitler came to power in 33 also. At one point, the Nazis said, all the Jews have got to leave Innsbruck now. There were only about 500. Somehow, at some point, she got out. You'll notice that they built a building in her name. There's also a Solomon building for Ava Solomon. Now, she went from Innsbruck to Shanghai to Sykesville to Baltimore. Those are some Jewish people in Shanghai. So here's the thing. You could get out. You could get out of Germany, you could get out of Austria. They wanted you out, but you couldn't get in anywhere. No one would let you in. Shanghai would let you in. Shanghai in China was a big cosmopolitan city. It was an open city. There was a Jewish community there, 22,000 Jews. It was a destination that you could get to. It took like 32 days on a boat to get there, but you could go to Shanghai. So here we have, look, look at all these people arriving in Shanghai. I mean, they're all Jews fleeing the Nazis. This, this particular group sailed from Italy. By the end of the war, there were only 250 Jews left in Innsbruck. So she stayed there and she became, she ran Springfield. She got higher than any other woman in Maryland's mental health system. Um, she eventually ended up being a, a moving to Baltimore. She was very high up, but she started out fleeing to Shanghai from Innsbruck and ended up in Sykesville. Ava Solomon lived her whole life in Sykesville. She either lived on Meller Avenue or Maple. I've seen it, two different stories, in a little home. Okay, what do we got next? So I'm going back in time a little bit. How did we get to the point where all this was possible. And that started when a guy named Gavrilo Princip, a Serb, assassinated the Crown Prince or the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife on the streets of Sarajevo and started all the dominoes tumbling. So this is a picture of that famous assassination. Immediately, all these things happen. All 
all in a row. You've, I don't know if you've ever read the Guns of August, but I'll just real quickly. He was a Serb. Austria, Hungary declare war on Serbia. Russia mobilized its forces. Germany declared war on Russia, France, and Belgium. Germany invaded Belgium. England declared war on Germany. Austria, Hungary declared war on Russia. Austria, Britain, and France declare war on Austria, Hungary. Japan declares war on Germany. I mean, you can read. The whole world just fell apart. It was an amazing disaster, and it led to the rise of Hitler. Okay, there's a man named Richard Glaser. Now we're going to go off on the third of these people I'm talking about. His name is Kurt Glaser. Richard Glaser was a young Austrian. He's about 27. Austria-Hungary went to war against Russia. Against Russia, he went to war. I think he was 27. He ended up as a prisoner of the Russians. The Russians creamed the Germans, but the Austro-Hungarians, uh, they had success among the Austro-Hungarians, which was an empire at the time, Austria-Hungary. Uh, they took 2.5 million prisoners, two million, this is the Russians, two million prisoners. They sent those prisoners to Siberia. When, Kirk Glaser was, when Richard Glazer was sent to Siberia, his wife, Hedwig, was present, pregnant. But he never met, Richard never met his son. The family, Richard's wife, Hedwig, and her son, Kurt, moved to Innsbruck when he was two. They moved from Vienna to Innsbruck. Innsbruck, as you can see, is a beautiful city. But it wasn't beautiful for a, a young Jewish boy. They lived in a little apartment. They had no running water, no hot water. A grandmom, a mom, young Kurt. He's two years old. He's the only Jew in the building. He's the only Jew in his school. Everyone's a Catholic. And there's a tremendous rise in anti-Semitism. In fact, the Jews have been kicked out of Innsbruck hundreds of times over hundreds of years, and it was gonna happen again. Because he was so smart, uh, at one point his mother got called in and the uh, person running the school said, look, your kid's so smart, he's getting all ones. Ones was the highest grade. And since he's a Jew, we're gonna knock a couple of them down because he'll get beat up. I mean, it'll cause animosity. So she reduced his grades. And it was a Catholic school. And every day they had religion. And when they had religion, they said, Kurt, you go outside and play. Because, you know, this isn't for you. So the priest was a tall, thin guy who wore a white coat. And he was really nice to Kurt. And one day he stops, he's being real nice to Kurt. And Kurt thinks, this guy really likes me. And, He's probably trying to get me into his religion, but I'm not into, Kurt was not into religion at all. Jewish, Catholic. Anyway, at the end of that class, Kurt's out there. All the kids come out and they start pounding him with rocks. Cut them all up, stitches in his head. The priest in a white coat had just told them that the Jews killed Christ. And that was the end of his friendship with that priest. So, the years pass. Kurt's six. Finally, in 1921, the Russians are letting the prisoners come home from Siberia. The war started in 1914, so Richard Glazer's now 34 years old. He's been sort of free in Siberia. They didn't have to keep a good look on, at, on, watch on the prisoners because there was nowhere for the prisoners to escape to, even though he tried twice and failed. And Russia had fallen apart. There had been a civil war, a revolution, the murder of the Tsar. Finally, the Bolsheviks were in power, and they said, all right, send these guys home. So they sent them home, and they're coming home on trains. Hundreds of trains full of Austrian prisoners are pulling into Innsbruck. And the Red Cross has given a list of names of who's on each train. Richard Glazer was never on one of the lists. They're waiting and waiting. The train station's packed with people. They're playing all this Austrian music. 
and uh, he's packed in there with his mom and his grandmom, and the trains keep coming. His name's never on the list. Finally comes the last train, it's got two cars. The first car has a list, he's not on it. And comes the last car. Men are standing on top, they're hanging out windows, and finally, this is the most powerful memory of his life, Kurt Glaser says, I hear, Richard, Richard. His mom has finally seen her husband after seven years. Okay. So Richard is an interesting guy. He, uh, first of all, Kurt is six. Now he's got a father. He doesn't know, he doesn't know this guy at all, you know? They're, they're strangers. They never form a strong bond. His father's a, a hacking chain smoker who can, can, can't get his breath and coughs all the time. They have a son, and then, and, and then he's got a son, a father. It's not the best situation for him, but uh, his father's also very kind. They called him the father of widows and orphans. Whenever anyone in Innsbruck had a problem, he was the first person there to help. He was also fanatical about right and wrong. There was no gray, there was no middle. These are actual orphans, Jewish orphans from a different pogrom, from Innsbruck earlier. Okay, next one. And then of course, by 1933, Hitler has through vicious means, extra legal means, taken over the German government. He's the chancellor of Germany. That quote down the bottom is uh, Neville Chamberlain declaring that Britain is going to war against Germany. That's a little premature there. Okay, go to the next one. So, Richard Glazer's successful. He has a business. I'm just looking for the actual... I should mention that while Kurt was still in school, after the priest thing, his life was fairly miserable. I mean, he went to a dance and, and all the kids were saying, don't dance with the Jew to, to, to him, you know, to the girls. He would walk down the street, people would come up behind him and call him a Jewish pig. He formed a, he formed a, a youth group. Um, he even carried like a handful of wire in, in, his, in his pocket and one day some guys uh, were trying to pick on him. He pulled it up and raked them up. He was not, he was defending himself. Um, Hitler came to power when he was about 18. So his father, got a business representing a German firm called Steinmetz. They made some sort of healthy bread or something. And he was very successful. He, he got one Austrian province, then he got another, then he was in charge of the franchise for all of Austria. He was so into it, he took everything he had. He even stole his kids' bank accounts to, to, to market. But they, they were successful. And they were so successful, they moved to the big, the big city, the big beautiful city of Vienna. They had a nice villa. They had a chauffeur-driven car. And then one day, in 1935, he's called in and they say, you are no longer in charge of your business. We've given the job to your bookkeeper, which devastates him. So he goes to the authorities and they say, hey, that's Germany, we can't help you. He goes to Berlin, it's 1935. Hitler's there, they can't help him. So on Yom Kippur, on 1935, he goes to see the bookkeeper to see if he can work something out. And this is a, a quote from Kurt Glaser. The bookkeeper raised his cane against him and my father emptied a pistol in him, completely, the entire magazine. This is out in the street. And they stoned him, and they arrested him and put him in prison. Prison. While all this was going on, Kurt, who was a brilliant student, was, was studying medicine in Vienna. He was almost finished. He was about to take the big test, the big anatomy test to complete his third year, and then he said, I have to give up medicine. My father just killed a man. Everything's over. This is done. I'm, I'm ruined. But a friend came and got him and made him take the test. He did so well 
that they gave him a job working at the university as an instructor in a dissecting room. And he got free tuition. But his father's in prison, his mom and his brother leave. It's getting very bad there. And then comes a famous event called the Anschluss. If you've seen The Sound of Music, when, when uh, what are they called, the Van Trapps, the Van Trapps family, the father's all upset, it's the Anschluss. The Germans and the Austrians have made an agreement that there's no more Austria. Austria is now Germany. There were Austrian Nazis, but they weren't necessarily dominant, but Ultimately, after a lot of trauma, Germany swallowed up Austria. So here they are, coming in, March 12th, March 13th. Kirk goes to see his, see his father in prison, and his father says, get out now. He's looking at him through a screen. Get out now, everyone, out now. Well, Kurt didn't get out in time. He's living on the fifth floor of, a, of an apartment. He's trying to get through school. He's supporting himself. He's all alone. He's just a young man. Then comes Kristallnacht. This is very famous. This is when they, this is the, night of the, the night of broken glass when, they just, when, when the Nazis just let it all fly and burned synagogues and broke all the German business, the Jewish businesses, broke all the windows. The night of broken glass. I mean, this was like a real turning point where you know these guys are serious. This is not something that's going to pass over. So, Kirk Glazer is living in an apartment building, and two Nazis come to get him. Someone had drawn a hammer and a sickle in the building. And as Kurt said, so of course it must be the Jew. They take him outside of the building. He's arrested. He's thinking about, he's trying to, he's thinking about running. He's thinking about all kinds of stuff. One of the guys blocked the window so he couldn't jump. When he goes outside, he sees a scene like this. The, uh, the Nazis are making the, the Austrian Jews scrub the streets. Kurt said with toothbrushes, although I didn't read it, that it was done with toothbrushes, they're scrubbing up some stuff that was put out. There was going to be some, some kind of vote about whether or not to join Germany. And now they have to scrub that stuff off the streets, hands and knees. And you can see the guys looking behind them. If you see their faces, they're, they're enjoying themselves. They've got smiles. They enjoy that humiliation. When they were picking up these Jews, they were jumping out windows. That's why when they came in to get Kurt, one of them went straight to the window. This is an actual shot of somebody preparing to jump out a window. He was captured. He was taken in. He was captured. Okay, next one. So, he's captured. And where they take him, they have a list. And on the list, everyone on the list is going to Dachau, which is the first death camp. And... Um, they keep him three days, but he's not on the list. So they let him go. He runs home, packs up what little he can. He's got friends blocking the windows and doors. He packs up and he gets out of there. Now he's on the run. He's on the run in Vienna. He's trying to get out, but you can't get out. He's going to embassies, Argentine embassy, Chilean embassy. Places he doesn't even know. He goes to the American embassy. They tell him where to go, they tell him where to go. He goes into the room with his visa. There's no one in there, but the entire room is filled with paper, stuffed with all these other people trying to get out. He tosses it in, he says, oh well, I guess I'm not going to America. But someone gets him a ticket to Shanghai it's a way out. He gets a, what's called a transit visa. He's got to go from Vienna to Switzerland. He's got seven days in Switzerland, maybe eight. 
Then he's got to get to France. Then he's got to get from France to London. And then he's got to get on a ship for Shanghai. He gets into Sweden and he tears up his visa. He's not going anywhere. He's staying in Switzerland. He stays in Switzerland. There's, they, they speak four languages in Switzerland, Italian, German, French, and some other obscure language. And uh, he can speak German, of course, but he can also speak book French. He settles in with a Jewish community in the French area. They take care of him, they keep him hidden. He gets into the University of Lausanne and finishes his medical degree. Have you ever seen The Empire of the Sun? That's another Steven Spielberg movie. That takes place in Shanghai, and uh, the kid in that, you know, okay, what I want to say is, Shanghai was okay for a while, but then the Japanese came in, and Shanghai became not so cool after, because the Japanese were just as bad as the Germans, and they, they herded everybody together into a ghetto. So, he comes to a border, there's a German border guard. For some reason, Kurt has, uh, is smuggling in a pen knife and a flashlight. I don't know why he picked those two items. And he gets over the border into Switzerland. He said it was unbelievable. He said it was the most amazing feeling of his life. I'm finally out of their clutches. And you've got to imagine, he's been a, he's been a fugitive. He's been... He's been turned into a German because Austria no longer exists. But he's in Switzerland. He stays in Switzerland. Finishes his degree. He goes, as I mentioned, he put in his visa at the American consulate, right? He actually gets picked. The United States was not accepting many Jews. They had a quota. They even sent some ships back. Um, Kurt said that FDR was, philosophy was delay, delay, delay. To get the visa to get out, he needed an affidavit. And it's a, a, someone on the other side saying, okay, he's a good guy, we want him. He got an affidavit, someone sent him an affidavit, they rejected it. Another one, they rejected it. Another one, they rejected it. Another, rejected it. The fifth one, they finally said, okay, you're good to go. He crosses into France. He's got, he's got a, a ship. He has a ship now. He has an affidavit. He can go to the United States. He just has to get to his ship. He crosses into France on September 1st, 1939. On that very same day, Germany crossed into Poland. 2,000 tanks, 900 bombers, 400 fighter planes, 1.5 million men. That's the beginning of World War II. The day Kurt Glaser arrives in France, Hitler arrives in Poland. Two days later, England and France declare war on Germany. He's now in France, and he's a German, and they're at war with Germany. Meanwhile, the ship that he's waiting for left New York, it's a French ship. Now that French ship has to go into hiding so it doesn't get submarined, torpedoed. He doesn't know where his ship is. The ship is hiding at sea. He gets to the ticket window for his ship. The ship's not there yet, but he goes to the ticket window and two men come up to him and they say, uh, where are you from? And he says, I'm Austrian. And they say, there is no Austria, you're a German. And they arrest him. They arrest him, he gets arrested. Now he's a prisoner of the French. And they put him in a wine cellar. They keep him prison in a wine cellar with a bunch of other guys. Um, there's no water, but there's wine. So he, could, he drinks wine, they take him out every day, they march him out. It's obvious that the French aren't ready for war for various reasons, like for instance, the soldiers are marching him are drunk and they don't have any shoes and they don't have any bullets. The French aren't ready for war, but it's coming. All right, so his ship arrives. They tell him, you can go, you can go get your ship. 
He goes to get his ship, it's a Friday. All he needs is some paperwork to allow him to cross a part of France. And the office where they have the paperwork is closed for the weekend. So his ship leaves without him. So now, what's he going to do? He finds some little guy in a booth, some little South American guy who sells him a ship, a, a, a ticket to an American ship. He gives that guy all but his last three dollars. It's called the President Harding. So he gets on the President Harding. It's, it's, a, it's a passenger ship that holds 350 people. They cram 700 on there. They put him down in the cargo hold. They give him some straw to sleep on. For some reason, he's down there with a bunch of Yugoslavian farm workers, one of whom keeps spitting across them all night into a bucket. It's not pleasant traveling, but he's on his way. He's finally on his way. And as soon as they get out, they are American. They're not at war yet. They turn on all the lights. They shine them on the flag. He's going to make it. But then they get word that a French ship has been sunk and they have to go save it. Well, it's an oil tanker. Nazis are shooting everything up now. Kurt says our captain had to make a choice. Captain's an American. Keep going or save these people. And he decides to try to save them. I read later that that's not necessarily what, what, what's true. He may have just stumbled into this situation. Either way, they go into a massive hurricane to save these people. And when they start getting them out of the water, they don't speak French, they speak English. That's because someone else has already rescued the French, but another boat has been sunk, a British ship, and they're, they're, they're saving these British guys. They saved like 25 of them. But they're in this hurricane. Um, and uh, this is an excerpt from an article about it. All agreed that most of the damage was caused by one gigantic wave that rolled in from port from the port side in the Stygian darkness at 9.36 Tuesday evening with an elemental force such as left the passengers, even yesterday, awestruck in. It heeled the vessel over on her side, and from stern to stern, and from bridge down to the engine room, every movable object and nearly every person aboard were thrown into a pile to the starboard. Almost instantly, the interior of the ship was transformed into a mass of debris. On the bridge, 77 feet high, Captain Roberts had just time to glimpse skyward as the crest of the wave before it knocked, it off his, knocked him off his feet. Carl Hegingberger, third officer, was thrown clear across the full length of the bridge and suffered a broken arm. Paul Johnson, 22-year-old cabin steward, he was sucked out to sea. So imagine if this room just tumbled over and we all went and hit the wall. That's what it was like. Hundreds of people, broken bones, broken backs. Kirk Glazer is not a doctor. He's a graduate from a school. He has no practical experience. The ship doctor rounds up all the doctors on the ship, including Kirk Glazer, and puts them to work. Sends them down into the, where the crew is, the hold, I don't know what you call it. Anyway, he comes across an American guy, he's a butcher, who has just been doused with boiling soup and is delirious and out of his mind. They tie him down and Kirk Glaser has to go get morphine for him. And he doesn't know this guy. Well, he's going he's to go get morphine for this guy. To get the morphine, he has to run from one side of the ship to the other in these amazing waves. He said that, he said that the captain had to drive into the waves, and the screws would come out and, and make all this noise, and it was horrible. So to get to the morphine, he's got to run across the ship with the water. <laughs> Uh, next one, please. So, they tie a rope. There's a rope on the other side, and there's a rope on this side. They put a rope under his arm, and he's got to run across the ship with the rope under his arm. There's two guys holding him steady, 
And at one point they say, go. And he runs across the ship. Halfway there, the ship rocks, and he's hanging out over the ocean by his arm. All he sees is the ocean, which is, you know, and he's only like 22, 24. He's, he's gone through all this stuff, and now he's hanging out over the ocean by a rope. And you know how they say you see your life flash before you, right before you die? He sees his mother's face in the water, which I kind of tried to depict there. He swings back. He makes it. He saves the guy. They save a whole bunch of people. When they pull into New York, there's ambulances waiting. There's fire engines. There's physicians. And to get to New York was not easy. They couldn't get out of the hurricane. They were in it for days. At one point, a Coast Guard ship was trying to help them, had to shoot supplies by rope onto the ship. So that, you know, the battered Harding. It was famous. This was the first American ship it wasn't really attacked, but a victim of the war. It actually mentions his name in the article that says Kirk Glazer from Baltimore for some strange reason. He could speak two words of English, hurt and where, because that's all he could say to the people as he found them. Hurt, where? Um, they improvised splint stretchers out of life preservers. They saved a hundred some people. There was only six doctors. So he made it to New York. He has no money. He has no friends. He has nowhere to go. The boat line gave him some money for his efforts. He was able to use that little bit of money. So where does he go? He goes to Philadelphia, of course, because when he was trying to get the affidavit, they were writing to people named Glacier, who, any old Glacier, one of the glaciers in Philadelphia, don't know him, not related to him, they said, yeah, come, come on, come. So he goes to Philadelphia. They give him a cot in their family room in their little row home. The woman's sister is a teacher. He takes a streetcar every night to her house. They do the dishes. They eat. She teaches him English. He comes home late at night on a streetcar. He comes, becomes friends with the streetcar driver. He learns English in two months. He's able to pass a medical test in uh, New York. And then there's a whole big 70 more years of story. <laughs> Can you, uh... so there, th there's his journey. Vienna to Innsbruck, back to Vienna, Germany, Switzerland, France, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago. He goes to Israel gets back with his mom for the first time in 12 years, Baltimore, and then eventually Sykesville. And he dies in Sykesville. He lives in Fairhaven a while. Uh, next slide. OK, so Richard Glaser, this is Kurt's father. This is what happened to his family. Go ahead. He was hanged in prison for murder. His wife and youngest son made it to Palestine. His wife got in illegally. The son got in legally. His father died on the way to Auschwitz. His three brothers died in Auschwitz. Two of his brother's wives died in Auschwitz. The youngest of the three wives was liberated by the Russians. Ava Solomon, she lived to 95. She was 94. She stayed in that house in Sykesville until the very end. Irene Hitchman, she made it to 77. Kurt reunited with his mother in Israel in 1951. He hadn't seen her in 12 years. He saw her from the boat, standing on the side. It was just like when she saw Richard. And he came back from Israel. He would have stayed there, but um, it was the McCarthy era, and he was afraid for some reason he was going to lose his American citizenship. So she came. His mom came and lived with him. And she died in 1982. And Kirk Glazer lived in Fairhaven, I believe, for the last 13 years of his month, of his life. He set up a, he set up a youth wing at Springfield. He came to Springfield later. The other two came to Springfield right away. He came later. OK, any questions? I covered it completely. <laughs> Thank you.